Thank you, David. Um, first off, I'd like to thank TAPAC because it was exactly two years ago, probably almost to the day, when you had your conference in Perth that um, I serendipitously met uh, Mike McFarlane back there and Laura Cook of the Save the Wings Ancient Cave Society. And that's actually where this project was born. It was through that conversation and that meeting. Um, and TAPAC, also this conference, has been part of the research and recording in Memes Caves. In 1984, um, the TAPAC committee asked the Royal Commission to make a record of the carvings of the Memes Caves because they were fearful of their survival. And we are really on that trajectory. Um, 4D Memes Caves, which is what we're going to intru introduce you to uh, now, is just the latest in 150 years of research and innovation at the Weems Caves. And Sue will tell you all about the process of doing the 4D Weems Caves. Um, but I would like to remind ourselves of the pioneering work that came before us. Oh, first, oh, does anyone want to forward? I would use the, the mouse. Arrow. Oh, right, okay. Things? I like to wonder, okay, I'll have to say then. <laughs> it should work. You're going to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, so first off, and I know these characters are familiar to many people in the audience, we have Sir James Young Simpson, an Edinburgh medical doctor who was an, a pioneer in the field of anaesthetics. He was a keen antiquarian, a member of the, uh, of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, and he visited the caves for the first time with flying visit in 1864 while he was researching cup and ring marks across the whole of the UK. Now, Sir James Young Simpson was the first person that we know of um, to make the link between the carvings that he saw in the Weems Caves with the symbols that we find in the Pictish standing stones and what we would term Pictish carvings. So he was the first, he was really crucial because he was the first to systematically um, record um, and describe the caves and carvings. And he, his artist, he, um, his publication was illustrated by James Drummond, an Edinburgh artist. Um, from 1868 to 1877, he was the curator of the National Gallery of Scotland. Um, and he made a great record of the carvings that they identified in many of the Weems caves, particularly Court Cave, Jonathan Cave, Jonathan's Cave and the Dew Cave. Um, now, you, the, the carvings that survive, um, we can see this isn't accurate if it's a sketchy portrait of the carvings, but they're extremely accurate. They all record the surviving ones are recognisable today. Um, and a very important record of the West Chamber of the Dew Cave, which has since collapsed, and so none of these carvings um, survive, or if they are, they're underneath a great deal of rubble. Um, and I'll just read you Simpson's description of the West Chamber of the Dew Cave. He described it as being the most magnificent, being high in the roof, nearly 100 feet in length and about 60 or 70 in breadth. In some light, the cryptograms on its high walls and dome-like ceiling show masses of beautiful and changing colours. Next up we have John Stewart, who's researching and working at the same time as Sir James Young Simpson. They would have known each other well. They're both members of the Society of Antiqui Antiquaries of Scotland. Um, John Stewart, also the secretary of the Spalding Society in Aberdeen. And the Spalding Society had a very important role in publishing the results of archaeological work at the time. So John Stewart had his finger on the pulse of what was going on in archaeology in Scotland. Um, of course, we know him for his, his fantastic publications, The Sculptured Stones of Scotland, the first volume published in 1865, which Sir James Young Simpson would have been very aware of, um, and the second one in 1867, which includes the Weems Caves carvings. Now, John Stewart used, um, presumably his friend, Aberdeen-based lithographer, um, artist and engraver called Andrew Gibb. I don't have a photograph of Andrew Gibb. I know he worked extensively in this area as well. If anyone has one, I'd love to, or a, a, sorry, a portrait, I should say. Um, please tell me. Um, I'd love to see what he looked like. Um, so Andrew Gibb brought his skills as an engraver um, to the fore and that he shows beautifully 
the inscribed nature of these carvings. They, they look very three-dimensional. Um, he's also, you can see some early Christian crosses there that he's depicted for the first time. I'm not aware that um, Sir James Young Simpson um, published those or drew those, illustrated those. Um, and again, an important record of the Duke Cave. Now we have our first female um, pioneer, a true pioneer actually, and I'm delighted that her book is being sold um, in the uh, in the stalls room. I think there's only one left, so if you haven't heard of her or, or come across her, it's, it's very good value. So Christian McLagan, born in Denny, by all accounts an extremely formidable character, um, credited by many as being the first modern female archaeologist in Britain. Also an artist, an antiquary, a philanthropist, and a feminist. Um, her innovation was in developing the technique of um, making rubbings of carved stones. There's no contemporary image of her that I know of. I think she actively avoided being depicted herself. This is a woodcut from that publication that you can buy, buy here. Um, and she published an account of her visit to the Weems Caves in PSAS in 1875, which was read by John Stewart because as a woman she could not be a fellow, she could only be a lady associate, so she wasn't allowed to read her own papers. And also I quote, um, her, the, the paper is illustrated with James Drummond's sketches because the style of Miss McLagan's drawings cannot be easily reduced. So she's left very little published record here. Um, Paula, some years ago actually mentioned her rubbings in the British Museum, where they are now curated, um, because she gave all of her work to the British Museum as a protest um, against not being accepted as a full fellow to the Society of Antiquaries in Scotland. So Scotland is not out there. And I personally haven't seen them, but I, well, I, I, one day I will make the, make the journey and, and have a look. So back to our bearded antiquarians. We have, um, they probably need no introduction, John Romney Allen and John Anderson, um, respectively um, Welsh civil engineer, antiquarian, and John Anderson, the keeper and secretary of the Scottish National Museum of Antiquities. So in 1903, of course, they published their early Christian monuments in Scotland, which covers all of the Weems Caves material, giant of a publication. Um, this, for the first time, really moved the knowledge along of, of early medieval um, symbolism in Scotland. Um, a careful analytical typography. They were trying to break these symbols down so that we could get a fuller understanding of their meaning. Um, they used James Drummond's illustrations in their work, not um, Andrew Gibbs, I don't know why. Um, what unites all of these researchers that I've just briefly gone through is that their approach to the carvings and Weems caves was as part of the body of early medieval, early Christian carved carved stonework in Scotland. They saw them as being as valuable and they were as the rest of them and they were as interested in them as the rest. Um, and this is, I think this is very important. It's something that's possibly been lost um, in more recent periods. Now we have a true um, innovator, pioneer, John Patrick, our first local man. He was born in Buckhaven. He started out life as a baker. <coughs> And he ended up in Edinburgh as a professional photographer. He was the first person to photograph the carvings in the Weems Caves. And the quality of um, his work and the skill involved in taking these photographs should not be underestimated. Um, he used magnesium ribbon to illuminate the carvings and enable a very long exposure. Um, and he ends up with beautifully crisp, high contrast photographs that aren't really better today. <laughs> So he applied the new technology of the time to an archaeological subject. And his, um, his value has increased, really, because as a local man, he also knew very well all the local stories and myths about the case. And he wrote about them in his publications. Um, many of these are retold in the Swax leaflets. So that intangible heritage about the case has been kept alive. And if we didn't have a local man recording these cases, we'd never, they would never have survived those stories. They're, they're way beyond living memory now. So he was the first, this is the first objective recording of the carvings that we have. This is the first image of the Jonathan's Cave boat carving. Um, and to all those doubters out there, there are some still, I think, 
who question its authenticity on the basis that the 19th century antiquarians didn't record it, I'll just read you a quote from James Young Simpson's Notes of 1864. On one of the smooth portions of the walls of the Dew Cave, a large anomalous figure is cut, two feet nine inches long, consisting of a large excavated irregular head, if we may term it so, <coughs> an elongated body, and six limbs stretching down from it. This forms the largest individual sculpture, but its shape and contour are, all, are most indeterminate. Perhaps it is intended as the figure of a boat. Finally, another local man, George Dees. I think maybe some people in this audience may have been lucky enough to have met this man. A Kokodi architect, passionate about the Weems Caves and the preservation of the carvings, and he added to this um, critical corpus of, of, um, of the recording of the carvings by photographing them in the 1920s. Um, this has been really useful because we can see what's changed and what's been added. So those of you who know the caves and um, have seen the cannon and the horizontal fish, these appeared at some point between 1902 and 1826. Um, in 1929, um, it, the foreman of the, of the Michael, Michael Colliery called George Dees before he filled up the Michael Cave of concrete, um, and George Dees called his friend Arthur Edwards, who made a hurried record of these probable prehistoric carvings in the Michael Cave before they were destroyed. This is the only record <coughs> we have of them, so again, a local man on the ground, um, well connected. From the, really from the post-war period on, um, like many other places in, in, in the UK, it's been a time of great social, um, economic and environmental <coughs> change in these weeds. And this has not been kind to the caves or the carvings. It certainly has had an impact on how the carvings are perceived. If we think back to Simpson's description of the cryptograms on the high walls that show masses of beautiful and changing colours, it's at odds with a lot of the current description of the carvings, which just refers to their damaged state and their vulnerability. I think their value, well, their value has certainly been eroded as a consequence of this. And I think um, modern picture studies may have overlooked the Weems case. There are exceptions, and um, one of these, A Light in the Darkness, um, has been the Save the Weems Ancient Cave Society, um, and I'll hand over to Sue to introduce you to them. Thank you, Joe. Um, September 1986 saw one of the lowest points in the entire history of the caves, because it was then that this car was driven into Jonathan's cave and deliberately set on fire. That blaze did irreparable damage. Uh, we lost several of the carvings, and I don't mean they were just damaged, they were lost altogether, just flaked away. Uh, but at least there was some good that came out of it, because it was this incident that prompted some local people into action. Shortly after this tragedy, Anne Waters called a meeting to gather together those local people who shared her interest in the Weems Caves and were prepared to do something about it, and that was the birth of Swax. Frank Rankin here became the first chair of the society. He wrote many of the booklets that we still sell, including the Caves Guide itself. Bill Barker was vice chair. He conducted the cave tours for many, many years. And Anne Waters uh, was secretary and involved in just about every aspect of the running of the society. So these three people were the mainstay of Swax and devoted a substantial portion of their lives to the cause. So we owe them a great debt of gratitude for their steadfastness and for all those efforts that they put in. We still continue to run the Open Sundays that they established, and people come from all over the country, as well as overseas, for our guided tours of the caves. One of the highlights during these years was the visit of Time Team in 2004. Their three-day investigation of the caves brought some welcome publicity, of course, but otherwise there's been very little in the way of serious archaeological Archaeological exploration in recent times. Uh, meanwhile,
while there were some destructive winter storms during the mid-90s that caused considerable erosion of the coastal path along near the caves. There have been a number of, at best, let's say half-hearted attempts to address this problem, but the situation is as yet unresolved. However, in April 2013, the plight of the caves was raised in the Scottish Parliament by our local MSP, David Torrance, on behalf of SWAX. As a result, a working group was set up under the leadership of Historic Scotland to pursue long-term solutions to the threats facing the, that face the caves. But also, funding was found to support the visualisation project. That idea that originated in Joe's conversation with uh, a couple of SWAX members at this conference two years ago. And this is the project that we want to focus on now. The plan was to use the latest technology to create an online version of the caves, which would enable people, wherever they happen to be in the world, to share something of the experience of visiting them. But just as importantly, this would be a community-based project. We wanted to involve local people in what they were doing, in what we were doing in as many ways as possible. Uh, the result, we hoped, would renew interest in the carvings and go some way to re-establishing their significance. Uh, this initial phase of the project was limited to just one of the caves, uh, but would bring to bear all the latest scanning and photographic techniques on this cave. It was Jonathan's cave that was chosen. And from there we could decide the best methods of data capture to roll out to the rest of the caves. A number of companies were invited to tender for work, and it was York Archaeological Trust, uh, with, among other things, their expertise in digital archaeology, who were successful, and so were recruited to come and carry out the work in collaboration with ourselves and our friends from SCAPE. So last November, the team were down in the cave with all their equipment. Uh, they used laser scanning, structured light scanning, and reflectance transformation imaging. Uh, so basically, uh, methods to um, capture the overall contour, uh, contours of the cave, both inside and out, and then more high definition techniques, which would capture the detail of each and every carving. Uh, and all this data was put together to produce an online model of the cave, which you can never get your way into. And Joel will be talking more about the mechanics of that in a moment. But basically, you can look around and you can home in on individual carvings to examine them in more detail. And you can even view the cave through time, hence 4D wings caves rather than just 3D. But the other arm of this project, we were also pursuing in parallel a different kind of data capture exercise. We were after the information that we could gather from our local residents. For this, we hired a nearby hall, which we put to use over the same weekend uh, uh, as a drop-in centre. We asked people to bring their old photographs to be scanned and to talk about their memories, and especially in relation to the photos that they were showing us. Uh, and their stories were either videoed or recorded, and so the website is enriched with all this additional data as well. In the case of videoing them, it was against the green screen so that uh, an appropriate background could be added later. We also took groups from the two local primary schools down to Jonathan's Cave to show them what was happening there. And these kids were so enthusiastic, they just loved it. They, were really, really uh, up for the, the experience of, of what was happening there. And they thought archaeology was really cool. They thought archaeologists were really cool. And more than one of them expressed the ambition to one day be an archaeologist themselves. Um, we got the schools in advance to uh, um, actually uh, contribute their own Pictish-inspired artwork, which we displayed in our drop-in centre. Uh, and we had visits from older students too. This is a group of college students uh, who came to see what was going on there. And people of all ages came in to uh, speak to us and share their recollections. As a result of all this, in April this year at the SWAC Samuel Lecture, which uh, uh, was the launch of the 4D Wings Cave website. We uh, 
Um, we actually managed to fill this hall. We, despite some last minute pushing about whether all our uh, claims we'd taken and the advertising had paid off, we filled this hall uh, for the lunch and we really pleased about that. And then in July, we were thrilled to be at the British Archaeology Awards where the project was highly commended in the category of best public presentation. Uh, so here I'm handing you back to Joe to introduce you to this website. <coughs> people who know these caves really well, that's brilliant. Um, some of you may not have ever visited East Ream, some weird caves, um, and some of you might have been there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or more. So I'm just going to pay, play you a minute to show you, I want you to notice the where the caves are in relation to the sea, where the car we're going to go into Jonathan's cave, which we um, digitally documented, so you can just see what it's like in there. You can see where the carpets <coughs> are um, on the walls. So we'll do that first. That's looking towards Buckhaven. That's up now, the biggest turbine in the world, I'm told, by then. This is an, a big issue for the caves. They are very, very coastal. There's uh, Mike and Paul going into the, this is Jonathan's cave. So you get a sense of the scale of it. And the Pictish carvings, interestingly, are on the wall that is usually very well lit throughout the day. The only carving that is on a dark wall, the north wall, is uh, the boat, which does distinguish it from its Pictish neighbours. Okay, now we're going to move straight into our hope. This is just taking you through the website because I do want you to go home, type 4D Wings Caves into your search engine and go and have a play with this. Um, this is all of that digital data that we captured. We've made an exact replica of Jonathan's cave. This is exact in every detail, locational detail and where the carvings are. And then with the carvings, all of that historic information that we have, which is actually quite hard to source, we've embedded it into um, the cave so that you can see previous re records of the carvings and then you can go and look at the carving in its present state and by using your virtual torch you can explore it for yourself and I've been talking to some of you who know the caves and carvings very well and actually you can see them better like this often than you can see than you can see in the cave so it's a great way of really um, getting to know the carvings again. That's about it. I would like to say that this is the, this is the online um, interactive portal so that you can explore the caves and the history of the carvings. But behind this website is a great deal of data, okay? Um, very, very high quality, high resolution digital data which has enormous research value. So we have this data that we can use, we can't put it online because it's too big, but we can use it to really study the carvings, look at how they've been carved, what damage has happened to them since. We can really look closely at the boat and compare it, for example, with the other carvings and see if we can detect and, and map differences and start quantifying differences. So it's a very, very important research um, tool as well. So, where do we go from here? Well, we haven't yet got the funds to roll out the project to the other caves, but we've not been idle. One of the photographic techniques, the reflectance transformation imaging, or RTI, is particularly powerful, but it needs relatively little in the way of specialist training or equipment. So we applied for, and have just recently been awarded, some funding from Awards for Scotland to buy everything we needed to continue this part of the work ourselves. Uh, we're right now looking for local volunteers that we can train up in the practice of this technique to help us record all the carvings in the rest of the caves. Uh, this will give us a full record of the state of the carvings at this point in time that we've never had uh, in such detail before. Uh, hence it provides us a baseline at 
against which we can me measure any future changes. Uh, and that working group I mentioned is still ruminating over the longer term plans and we have hopes of one day achieving all our aims, but at the moment there is still a long way to go. But thank you very much for your attention and please do go have a play. Thank you.